Okay, I'm going to read you some stories from a book. This book is authored by a man named Rob. Uh, He says he recently published a book. It's titled Campfire Tales from Uncle Rob. He says you can find the book on Amazon. That's Campfire Tales from Uncle Rob. And he claims that every one of the stories in his book is true. So I said he published it recently. I don't know when I got this email. It could have been a year ago. But I'm going to read these stories. It's really good. So let's start with the first one. It's called The Pond Stalker. I used to spend a lot of time fishing on farm ponds. Back when I was younger, there were ponds like that everywhere. And many of them actually had water and good fish in them. But today, finding a farm pond with good fish is like being struck by lightning, only not as painful. Most of our ponds have dried up due to drought. Healthy farm ponds are their own finite ecosystems. Fish like largemouth bass and crappie and channel cat and bluegill thrive in these ponds, but aside from that, those ponds are a stable source of water for animals, both wild and domestic. And sometimes they are a source of water for the stranger creatures of this world. Literally, they're places where the things go bump in the night. A few years ago, I was fishing in one of these ponds. It wasn't especially big, but it was still a pretty good size. It had a marginal population of bass and a nice community of crappie. And though I had not witnessed it, I was told there were even a few channel cats lurking in the depths. My friend Terry and I decided we were going to do some night fishing to see if we might tangle with some of those mythical catfish we had heard about. We had seen some crawdads and water dogs in preparation for bank fishing that we were planning. Just before dark when we got there, we quickly set up for the night. There was a nice spot on the bank that gave us full access to the main part of the pond. Now, in the middle of the pond was a large tree with a few smaller trees scattered around it. There were lines and lures and bobbers hanging from those tree limbs like Christmas ornaments in silent testament to the misfortune the farmer had suffered while fishing there. I had caught my share of bass and crappie around those trees, but on that night we were fishing for channel cats. We had what we considered a foolproof plan mapped out complete with the kind of bait That was like fried chicken to a catfish. To our left, the pond narrowed a bit and curved around. Access to the water there was partially blocked by brush and patches of cattails. Not far beyond that, the area was choked with brush, but we managed to get five lines set out along that region. We walked a narrow cow path with the pond on our right and the brush on our left and nothing but brush and a few tall trees and gullies and washes to our left and they stretched out to a horizon of small hills and bluffs. We set our lines in places where the shore opened up, with the idea that the fish could easily make their way to the struggling crawdads and water dogs that we had hung just below the water's surface. Any movement the bait made would be like ringing the dinner bell. Once we got that done, we set up our little camp. We gathered wood to build a fire and some cowboy coffee and opened a couple of cans of beans to heat on a flat rock. Then we cast out a few rods right in front of us and settled in for a long night of good fishing. And for extra light, we had a lantern and a flashlight. The night was warm and pleasant and the sky was clear with little to no wind. It doesn't get any better than that. We'd been sitting there a while talking about the fish that we were going to catch and spinning tails when Terry remarked, You know, this is the pond where that old man drowned, right? Uh, no, I answered. I didn't know that. When was that? Well, it was back in the 70s, Terry said. I was still in high school. I thought for a minute and I said, I guess I never knew about that one. And then Terry said, I'm pretty sure it was here that it happened. It was a sad thing and kind of weird. He took a sip of coffee and added, Folks said they found him up on the bank. Well, how was that weird? I asked, not quite getting his point. He wasn't in the water, Terry answered. Okay, well, I shrugged it off. Seeing that I wasn't understanding the gravity of his statement, Terry explained further. He was on the bank. If he drowned, why wasn't he in the water? Well, I scratched my head and suggested that maybe the wind blew him up on the bank. Or maybe somebody moved him, Terry said, quick to reply. Now, why would anybody do that? I asked him. 
more than a little disgusted by the thought. Well, folks said he drowned, but he had been on the bank for a few days before they found him, Terry said. Yeah, I agree, that is a bit weird, I admitted. Makes you wonder. I was beginning to get a little uncomfortable with the subject matter, so I suggested that we walk the bank and check those other lines. Terry offered to help, but I told him, Nah, you stay here and watch our rides. Maybe a big one will try to pull one in. Okay, I said. We'll trade off. You go this time and I'll take the next turn. That's a deal, I said as I headed down the path. A holla if you need help with the big one, he called after me. It was good and dark by then, but the lantern that I was carrying cast a nice halo of light on the path around me. The water dog on the first line was still alive and wiggling, so I moved to the second. I was bent over pulling the crawdad on that second hook out of the water when the hair stood up on the back of my neck and I got the eeriest feeling that I was being watched. I lowered the bait back into the water and I turned around, and with the lantern held as high as I could get it, I scanned back into the brush, but it was too dark to see anything. I think that damn story about that old man drowning on dry land has got me spooked, and I was telling myself that as I moved on down the bank to the next line. I was almost to it when I heard a rustling in the brush to my left. Again, I held the lantern up and I searched the brush, but it hadn't gotten any lighter out, so I still couldn't see. At the next line, the sound came from directly behind me. It was crunching sounds like footsteps. It had to be a raccoon, I thought. Or maybe it was some other animal moving around back there. The lantern light that felt so adequate before now seemed pretty feeble. I needed to get better light, and the noise stopped when I turned around. I rushed to check the rest of the lines, and each time I stopped, I could hear the rustling in the bushes behind me and to my left. But whenever I turned to look, I didn't see anything, and we didn't catch any fish either. I made my way back, and a passing thought occurred to me. What if Terry was messing with me? First he tells me this spooky story, and then he follows me down here and makes noises to scare me. But when I came around the little bend and topped the rise in the trail, I had a clear view of Terry sitting by the fire. He would have had to have hustled to get back there ahead of me. It wasn't his style. You catch anything? He asked, and I walked into the firelight. No, nothing, I answered the bait was still on. I sat the lantern down and asked if he had any luck. Look in the ice chest, he said with a grin. Well, I opened the lid and I saw a nice three-pound bass. Oh, that's nice, I said. What'd you catch him on? Terry smiled and he said, I caught him on your rod, the one with the crawdad. Oh, that's cool, I said, and I shut the lid. I settled in with a cup of coffee, and I was debating about whether or not to tell Terry about the noises I heard, but I decided not to. Half an hour later, it was his turn to check the bank poles. He headed out with the lantern while I assured him that I'd be watching the rods. And I watched him disappear around the bend, and I wondered if there would be any fish on those lines, and if he would hear the same noise as I had heard. Fifteen minutes later, he came back empty-handed, and I asked about it, and he said that the bait was still hanging. He made small talk about possibly moving the lines in a bit, while he poured himself some coffee. Then he asked me about the rods we had out right there, and I told him we didn't get a bite. While we talked, I watched him. I was staring at the fire, but I was watching him. He seemed a bit off. He kept looking in the direction of our bank lines, but he didn't say anything. I considered asking him if he'd heard the noise, but I decided there wasn't any point in getting him worked up if he hadn't heard anything. After a while, he blurted out, you know, some folks say that old man's ghost haunts this place. Well, I sat straight up and I stared right at him. Get the hell out. You believe that crap? You don't, he asked. But you're a Catholic, aren't you? Yeah, well, what does that have to do with anything? The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, he said. Isn't that a Catholic saying? Well, I rolled my eyes. Dude, cut it out. You're killing me. I said as I threw the rest of my coffee out on the ground. He laughed and said, whatever, it's your turn to check the lines. All right, I grumbled and I grabbed the lantern. I was walking away and Terry called out to me, watch out for the Holy Ghost. I displayed a prominent finger over my shoulder and I kept walking. 
By the time I got to the first line, I had convinced myself that Terry was messing with me. Somehow, he had to be making those crunching noises, and I had an idea for how I was going to prove it, assuming that something would happen. Even though the first line still had bait and no fish, I was relieved because there was also no noise. I was halfway to the second line when it started. Crunch, crunch, crunch. It was coming from the brush to my left again. And this time, I didn't hold the lantern up to look around. Instead, I turned and ran back to the can to determine to beat him back to the fire and catch him coming out of the brush. But when I came around the turn and up the rise, I stopped in shock. Terry was sitting at the campfire right where I left him. There was no way he could have beat me back to the camp through the brush while I was running down that path. The run back and the adrenaline rush had me breathing hard, so I stepped back for a minute to catch my breath. And while I stood there, I kept an eye on Terry while checking over my shoulder. I took that opportunity to look for a second path, just in case, and while I stood there, Terry got up and bent over one of the rods. He messed with it for a minute, probably tightening the line. Maybe he had a bite. After a minute, he returned to his seat, and finally I decided it was time to return to the campfire. Terry threw another log on it while I took a seat. Well, that didn't take long, he said. Yeah, there's still nothing on those lines, I told him. Did you see any holy ghost, he asked, as he added a few more pieces of wood. I ignored his chuckle, and I said I was going to check my bait. And afterward, I asked if he had any bites while I was gone. Not sure, he said. This one here had slack in the line, but I didn't see anything hit it. Maybe I should check my bait too, he said, getting up and reeling in the line. After that, we sat in silence. We watched our rods and we sat by the fire and we stared into the night, but we never talked. Terry finally got up and said, this fire's making me sleepy. I'm going to go check our lines and we don't have anything this time we should move on sounds good to me i said not sure if he heard me terry was right the fire was making me sleepy too we were out of coffee so i got up and stretched i had just sat back down when i saw terry coming back down the path he was walking pretty fast and he was clearly upset that's it he barked at me you need to cut the crap his eyes were wild and he was agitated by something. I knew then that he had heard those sounds too, but I wasn't sure what he was accusing me of. What? I asked. You heard me. It's not funny. I don't know how you're doing it, but cut it out. It really isn't funny. What the hell are you talking about? I asked, even though I was beginning to understand. You were making noise back in that brush. Well, I started. It's not funny. He was hot. I thought it was you, I said. It's not funny, he exclaimed. You heard noises too, I asked at the same time. Wait, he said, looking at me. That wasn't you? Hell no, it wasn't me, I answered. You never left the fire while I walked down there. I stayed right here, I said. We stood there looking at each other for several minutes, and then together we turned and looked back down the trail. I think we were thinking the same thing. What the hell was it? Terry turned back to me and asked one more time. Now, it wasn't you. You're not lying to me. I swear it wasn't me, I assured him. I heard the stuff too. I thought it was you, especially after all that talk about that guy drowning and ghosts and stuff. Terry shook his head. I started talking about that stuff because the first time I went back there, I heard that crap and I thought it was you. So I thought I'd creep you out so you'd stop. Now I was shaking my head. Exactly what did you hear, I asked him. I heard footsteps back in the woods and stuff being stepped on. Did you hear the same thing? Same thing, I said. Well, maybe it's a cow or an ornery old bull, he suggested. We decided that we would check the lines together. I took the flashlight. Terry carried the lantern, and we set off down the bank. Terry checked the first line. The bait was there, so he dropped it back in the water. As he did so, we heard it. It was the same crunching footsteps we had heard before. The flashlight was a weak little thing, but it shined into the brush to try to see something while Terry held the lantern high. There was no movement back there and no shapes to be seen, and as soon as I turned the flashlight back down the path, the crunching in the brush started again. 
Were we hearing footsteps? If so, what was back there walking around? How about we pick up our lines and get the hell out of here, Terry said. It's a damn good idea, I answered. While I kept the flashlight on the brush, Terry pulled up the pole and threw the bait into the water. And then we moved to the next pole. He was pulling up that pole and we heard it again. This time, when I aimed the weak beam of light into the brush, I thought I saw a vague figure of something. Hey, did you? I began and then I stopped abruptly. Terry was standing beside me now. In the area where I thought I saw the shape, I was now looking at a pair of red eyes. Terry lifted the lantern higher and they disappeared. Or maybe they blinked. A few seconds later, the eyes were back. They were six feet off the ground, maybe 30 feet back in the brush, and those two red eyes were staring right at us. What the hell is that? I whispered. I don't know, Terry whispered back. It ain't no holy ghost. Let's get the hell out of here. Come on, let's go. I didn't argue with him. We both took off down the trail at a brisk pace, and behind us and off to our right, we could hear those footsteps following us. Terry led the way with the lantern held high, and I followed with the flashlight shining it all around us. We cleared the little rise and found ourselves back at the dying fire. Immediately, we turned and looked back to see if the eyes were behind us. We didn't see anything at that moment. Let's reel up and get the hell out of here, Terry said after a minute. All right, I'm with you. We reeled in our lines as fast as we could, and we kicked dirt on the fire. I took the rods and both the lantern and the flashlight while Terry carried the ice chest in our bait bucket. We climbed the slope up to where the truck was parked, thankful that we had left the tailgate down. And while I started the truck, Terry set the ice chest in the back of the truck and opened it. When I went back to shut the tailgate, he was standing there staring into the ice chest. Where the hell's that fish? He demanded. It's not there? No, it's not there. I looked into the chest myself, but he was right. The three-pound bass was gone. Did you throw my fish back, Terry accused. Now why the hell would I do that, I demanded to know. He threw his hands up in exasperation. Fish don't get out of an ice chest and walk off on their own, he said. Look, I swear, buddy, I didn't throw that fish back in the water. The last time I saw it was when you had me look at it after my first trip to check those lines. The only time we were both away from that fish was when we went to check the lines together, and we both turned and looked back toward the pond. Well, forget it, Terry said. Let's get out of here. As we drove toward the gate, we were both looking for reasonable explanations. Terry said, it had to be a big old bull out there. Do bulls have eyes that glow red? I countered. We passed a dozen cows as we neared the gate and so I swung the truck around to shine my headlights on them. Their eyes all shined yellow. Okay, so it's not a bull, I said. Terry was quiet. I think he was still angry about the missing fish. What about our bank lines, I asked. Well, we can come back in the morning and get those, he answered, and I agreed. In the daylight, he said, and I nodded my head. Maybe about 11, well after daylight, he said. That sounds like a real good idea, I replied. I picked Terry up early and we went to have some breakfast before heading back to get our bank lines. And when we got to the pond, Terry raised his brows when I pulled a shotgun out from behind the seat. It's just in case, I told him, as I put a shell into the chamber and put the safety on. Well, maybe there'll be some fish on the hooks after being out there all night, Terry said. Together, we walked down the slope to where our fire had been the night before. We realized that we had left our coffee pot and cups behind in our haste to vacate the premises. That gave us both a chuckle. The laughter stopped when we ventured down the bank to retrieve our lines. The brush beneath the high bluff on our left didn't seem nearly as foreboding as it had in the dark, but we still couldn't see much back there. We could see now that there was quite a bit of water standing back in there that we hadn't seen the night before, and it was odd that we hadn't noticed it before. And what was even stranger was that all three of the bank lines that we had left were gone. Something or someone had taken them. Through the years, Terry and I speculated quite a bit on what we might have experienced that night. 
We always came up with more questions than answers. What was making those footstep sounds? Were those red lights really eyes? If so, what did they belong to? And what happened to Terry's fish? And what happened to our bank lines? We tried to find rational explanations for what happened. It was an animal back in the brush. Maybe a deer. The eyes could have been an owl in a tree or maybe a possum or a raccoon. And then we'd wander into less logical territory. Did it have anything to do with the old man who had drowned there? Was the place haunted? Maybe someone or a group of someones was messing with us. They took the fish in the bank lines, or maybe someone wandered up on those lines the next morning before we got back there and took them. We wondered if they had been hooked up with fish. Or maybe, just maybe, something we didn't know stalked us that night, and it took the lines. Something with red eyes. Okay, that is a really good story. I'm going back to the top here. to I want to tell you the name of the book again so you guys... I might buy this book. This is pretty good. Let's see. Uh, Campfire Tales from Uncle Rob. It's on Amazon. Just do a just do a search for Campfire Tales from Uncle Rob. If it's still for sale on Amazon, it'll still be there. You guys buy his book. I'm sure it's elect, in an electronic version or... Probably in paperback. I don't know how all that works, but that's a good story. And if this book is full of stories like this, it might be worth a good read. So I thought I'd share with you, share that with you. Thanks, Rob, for sending. Thanks, Rob, for sending this to me. This was really good. The title of that story was "The Pond Stalker." I thought it was an excellent story. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. We'll see you on the next one. Thanks.